A lot of people coming in. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, you are popular, Tom. We can't seem to stop the flow of people. Okay, I think I'm done clicking admit. All right, I'm gonna give it one more minute and then we can take it off. Okay, um, Goda, is it okay if we get started? Yeah, sounds great. Okay, well, Tom, thank you very much for joining us. Um, as you can tell, you're extremely popular. We're still admitting folks from the waiting room. Um, and thank you to Mina for inviting Tom to speak with the folks here at SBC. Um, normally, you know, I used to intro our um, speakers or our guests, um, and then I found it really odd because I've already shared your bio with everyone and I'm sure everyone's read it and that's why they're here to listen to you speak. Um, so instead of me introducing yourself, you know, you've had an incredibly varied journey through industry, government, academia, and even the tech sector. Um, if you could just outline a few highlights that shape your thinking today um, and how it impacts your work at Schmidt Futures, that would be great as just some context to get us started. Yeah, so if I think about my career um, what, one of the things that I've done is to try to bridge the divide that exists between uh, the scientific and technical community on the one hand uh, and the uh, public policy community. Um, so, you know, if you were to think about uh, what's the background of people who are involved in, in public policy, um, it is largely people who have a legal background or maybe a PhD in economics, they've worked on the Hill, they've worked at a think tank, they've been involved in helping to uh, elect a president. Um, but if you ask them, you know, how many computer scientists do you know? How many electrical engineers do you know? How many people do you know who are working on synthetic biology or, or quantum computing? Um, you know, these are not people that they tend to hang out with. <clears throat> so I think of it as, Kind of being the equivalent of of different cliques at high school when you had, uh, you know, jocks and nerds and the theater kids, for example, and not a whole lot of overlap uh, between those those cliques. And so, what an important thing that I've done uh, in my profession is to be a member uh, of those different communities and to try to increase the mutual comprehension uh, between those those communities. So I'll, I'll give you one example. So in the late 1990s, uh, I was working for President Clinton and um, I uh, stumbled across uh, a group of program managers working at agencies like DARPA and NSF who were beginning to uh, pay attention to the emerging field of nanoscale science and engineering. Um, and I thought this was really interesting and I asked them, um, if we, if the president decided to make this field a priority and give you some additional research funding, what are some things that might come out of it? And they said things that were to a policymaker totally incomprehensible. They said, well, we might be able to develop a material with a Young's modulus of this many gigapascals. We could create functionalized nano engineered MRI contrast agents, and we could uh, create uh, molecular memories with a storage density of 10 to the 15 bits per cubic centimeter. And, you know, after talking to them to, uh, for a while and understanding the 
the uh, the research that they were talking about, I was able to turn that into storing a device the size, uh, 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 st uh, storing the equivalent of the Library of Congress in a device the size of a sugar cube, detecting cancerous tumors before they're visible to the human eye, um, and making materials that are stronger than steel, but a fraction of the weight. <clears throat> and armed with those examples, I was able to get uh, President Clinton um, excited about the long-term promise of this field. I was very clear that achieving some of these goals uh, what was going to take you know a decade or more. Um, and he went to Caltech and gave a speech in which he announced uh, that he was going to double the federal funding for research in this area. Um, and over the years, that's resulted in tens of billions of dollars in federal investment. Uh, a lot of other countries copying the United States and launching something similar. And now we're beginning to see um, you know, new products that take advantage of nanoscale materials, devices, and structures. Um, so that, that's the type of thing that I've tried to do is by being a member of both in interacting with scientists, engineers, and entrepreneurs on the one hand, and the policymaking uh, communities on the other, uh, to identify something that, at least in my view, uh, we should be doing uh, that we're not currently doing. And you're on mute, Ruchi. I'm on mute, so that is kind of surprising. Um, thank you for sharing. Um, a few years ago, we had um, Bruce Scheisschnein uh, speak at, um, at SBC, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with his work, but his textbook was like, you know, the textbook yes. uh, of on photography. encryption. Yes. Yeah, yeah, on encryption. And and he he was, you know, really pitching public interest uh, technologists and public interest technology um, and really pushing that uh, to South Park Commons members. And, and it's very similar to a lot of things that you're talking about, you know, like marrying public policy with technologists who are interested in entering those areas. And a big um, a thing that came up in that conversation with him back then is that the for us as technologists, we just don't see the demand side of the marketplace. So even if we were interested in like you know even simple things um, around public interest law, or public interest technology, like it was just impossible for us to find these projects um, because there doesn't seem to be a very efficient marketplace around demand and supply. Um, and I was just wondering in your experience, um, is that changing? Is there something out there? Um, like, you know, is someone working on just like even creating that marketplace? Because there seems to be a lot of supply from, or like desire from us as technologists to serve in that manner. And there is quote and unquote demand, but we just don't see it. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, we, we've uh, tried to invest in some projects that will help with that, but I don't want to pretend that as a solved problem. So for example, uh, we support something called the Tech Talent Project, uh, which is designed to try to help solve this for the federal government. So the, the federal government uh, needs uh, more technical people, uh, people who work on software engineering, product management, human-centered design, data science, cybersecurity, and the Tech Talent Project, which is led by Jennifer Anastasov, who is um, the former head of people operations for the US Digital Service, um, is on the one hand, <clears throat> interviewing people who are technical, who are interested in public service. On the other hand, talking to the White House um, and the federal agencies to find out where the demand is, uh, you know, particularly in senior level positions. Um, at the entry level, um, we have been uh, supporting people like uh, Chris Kwong, um, who um, uh, created a, a, a program for young uh, technologists to enter the government and, and figuring out how to make that. Um, and then we've also been uh, supporting uh, an effort to make government hiring uh, more efficient by having multiple agencies identify what their needs are. So as opposed to saying, oh, I've got a match with 
you know, this particular agency to have the government say, you know, these 10 agencies all want to hire more product managers, uh, or these agencies all want to, you know, need more data scientists. So uh, there's lots more to do. To do. Um, you know, the other thing that I see happening is technologists creating new um, social enterprises. So I don't know if you've had uh, Clem uh, Jacoby talk, um, but she's a former uh, Google APM. Um, she's interested in criminal justice reform. Um, she created a, a new organization called Recidivis, which is about using um, modern software engineering and, and data science to improve decision making that can reduce prison recidivism, um, and you know she's just one of many examples of, of people who are creating, uh, and that and obviously that's creating a lot more opportunities for other technical people, yeah. who don't necessarily want to be a founder, but if, if someone can, there's someone who, who can identify that opportunity and do some of the fundraising, then they're delighted to participate as as yeah. a, as an engineer. Yeah, I, I just want to point out that the example that Tom gave um, is actually a pretty phenomenal project. Uh, and she built a for-profit venture that is doing um, actually pretty well um, and, and did raise uh, venture funding, traditional venture funding. And she's basically building a better decision um, framework for like, you know, figuring out like when uh, people should go on parole or when people should be discharged um, and so on and so forth, as opposed to it being manual. Again, this is just more context for SPC members because it is a very inspiring project um, and everyone should look it up. Um, so going back, just like combining a few different themes that we've already talked about, at SPC, we also seek out pretty exceptional, talented folks to join our community. Um, and we don't really care that the in their earlier stage of exploration or they'll pivot multiple different times. Um, we're more interested in seeing that when they are part of the community and they're interacting with each other, what kinds of projects come out from it. Um, and it feels like Schmidt Futures um, also tends to invest in talent. Um, and I'm curious, like what was your thesis in investing in talent rather than ideas? Um, because of the kinds of projects that you guys work on. I, I would have thought it would be the other way around. Yeah, I, I would say we do a combination of both. I mean, obviously, um, you know, uh, particularly when we're investing in people who are a little farther along in their career, we also want them to have an idea. Uh, so we're not just going to say, oh, you seem smart. You know, we'll give yeah. you some money and hope that something good will come out of that. Um, so we, we are identifying people who we think have an idea that, you know, if it worked out, there would be significant societal upside. So for example, we support um, a team at um, U UC Berkeley and the University of Chicago, um, uh, Sendel Melanathan and, and Ziad Obermeyer, um, who have launched something called Nightingale Open Science. Um, and they're identifying opportunities to uh, use machine learning to improve decision making ar around healthcare, um, and have actually, you know, been able to work with multiple healthcare providers to get access to the data, which is the, the hard part of this. Um, so um, they had the, you know, the kernel of the idea, uh, which is why we dis we decided to support them. Um, Another person that we support is uh, Saul Griffith, who is the CEO of something called The Other Lab. Um, and he's been an amazing uh, serial inventor uh, for uh, coming up with ideas for energy and climate. Uh, so it's it just had a big impact in the, in the energy and climate space. Um, we, another researcher we should support at University of Chicago, um, Dana Suskind is interested in addressing the word gap. Um, so by the time poor kids get to kindergarten, there's already a diff large difference in their vocabulary size. And this is driven by the amount and quality of interaction between 
um, a low income child and their parent or, or caregiver. Um, so it, it's not just the number of words that they're exposed to, it's the amount of serve and return dialogue. Um, and so she is, uh, you know, her background is in uh, early childhood development. Um, and uh, so we were able to connect her with some technical people because she was interested in creating something that would be the equivalent of Fitbit for parents uh, that would be able to measure the number of conversational turns using machine learning and, and speech recognition. Um, so yeah, we're always looking for the people who have an idea that if it worked, um, you know, would be a big deal. Um, and, you know, people who are intrinsically motivated to, to solve these important problems, because uh, in, in areas like economic and social mobility uh, and, uh, and energy and climate change and healthcare, um, it's not that we have a shortage of problems to work on. Got it. And speaking of problems to work on, um, what according to you are the top three social challenges that you'd like to see software engineers tackle? Um, and we have a very technical audience here. Um, so if, you, if, you, if they're looking for ideas, where would you point them to? Yeah, so what, one thing about software um, that I, I don't think that uh, policymakers have totally wrapped their head around is that it has a very different cost structure uh, from the way that we traditionally think about solving a, a problem. So let me give you an example. So do you have a guess as to how many adults living in the United States are reading at the third grade level or below? I don't know. Audience, does anyone have a guess? Please unmute yourself and speak up. Anyone? 60%. Say... Yeah, 50%. So there are 36 million adults who are reading at the third grade level or below. Um, and so, you know, the way a policymaker thinks about this is what is the cost to deliver, say, in this, this case, adult basic education, adult literacy, um, times the number of people uh, that you, you would want to serve. So let's say that it like, costs like $2,000 per person or $4,000 per person. Uh, then it would be, if it was $4,000 per person, then, and you were trying to serve another million people, um, then it would be $4 billion, which is a lot more than we currently spend on adult literacy. Um, well, how would a technologist think about this? They would say, well, there's, there might be some fixed cost to develop something that was like really high quality and engaging, um, and uh, um, but then once you've figured out how to pay for those fixed costs, then the marginal cost uh, of making it available to more people would be really low. And that's like why a company like WhatsApp uh, with you know 50 engineers at the time it was acquired can have a market cap of $17 billion because the marginal cost of making WhatsApp available to more people is really, really low. So I think that's like one general area that I would point to is, is there an opportunity to um, solve at least some portion of a societal problem in a way that the marginal cost of making it available to more people is really low. And I think adult literacy is an example of that uh, and something that we've been talking to um, Duolingo about, you know, clearly they've, made some progress on uh, second language instruction. Uh, but the question is, you know, is, is there something that they could do just to, to help address the just low literacy problem? And if they did, is it something that could, would be relatively straightforward to scale because the marginal cost of making it available to more people would be low? Any other ideas? Well, um, so if I think about the climate problem, um, one of the things that is so challenging about it is that we have this very limited window of time in which to solve it. So does anyone know when Bell Labs developed the first solar cell? 
any, any guesses? You could just, people could just put it in the chat if they have a if they have a guess for when they're without googling it. Yes, 1950, very close. Uh, 1954 uh, is when the first solar cell was developed. Um, well, if you think about the time since 1954 to like 2021, when like solar is actually now large enough to begin to show up in the statistics for uh, you know production of electricity, um, that's almost uh, 70 years. And uh, if we want to meet these really ambitious 2040 and 2050 goals, um, we have a much shorter window of time uh, in which to address them. So it, as I think about, well, what would accelerate progress? Um, it's at least plausible to me that there are uh, some things about the, at the kind of com combination of robotics and computer science that could accelerate the pace of scientific discovery. Um, and so <clears throat> some people are calling these self-driving labs, uh, sort of a, by analogy to self-driving cars, in which you automate the process of doing a scientific experiment, measuring the results, and then using uh, machine learning um, to say, what experiment should I do next? Um, because there are many areas of science where there are so many possibilities. There are like 10 to the 60th uh, you know, possible combinations of uh, organic uh, molecules, for example. And so a brute force approach of trying everything um, is just not going to work. Um, and so the question is, if you combine uh, robotics for automating the experiment, uh, simulation, um, informatics for managing the data, and machine learning for figuring out what experiment to do next, uh, could you reduce the time to solution? And, you know, I think it's too early to say, oh, definitely. Um, but I think there's significant enough promising results uh, so that I think this is a really plausible uh, direction for both researchers and, and startups. Um, so you're already beginning to see companies begin to do this in biology uh, with Emerald Cloud Lab uh, as an example and a lot of researchers interested in um, what people are calling autonomous experimentation or, or self-driving labs. So I think that's a, a really promising area for making progress on the, on the climate problem. The other thing that you're beginning to see is the formation of communities who are specifically interested in um, how do we uh, leverage advances in, in specific areas of computer science to solve a given societal problem. So one example of a, a community that we support is called uh, uh, Climate Change AI. Uh, and it was started by uh, two graduate students and a postdoc um, and is now this global community um, that has organized a detailed research roadmap of dozens of different ways in which machine learning and data science can contribute to climate change mitigation and adaptation. Uh, we and some other foundations have supported them to run an RFP. Uh, they organize workshops at the major machine learning conferences like uh, NeurIPS and, uh, and ICML. Um, and it's a good example of um, this kind of more general phenomena that some universities are calling CS plus X. That is, you know, what we need is people who not only have expertise in computer science, but um, have enough domain understanding to be able to collaborate with experts in this field and say, you know, what are some of the different ways in, in which advances in computer science and software engineering and data science, machine learning, et cetera, uh, can make a difference to solve this scientific or, or societal problem. I think Omar had a related question here. Omar, do you want to jump in? Oh yeah, sorry. This was just a quick question. What is the relationship between self-driving labs or autonomous labs and climate change? Um, oh, yeah. I didn't quite get that. 
so if you look at the several dozen areas where we need to um, make progress if we, if we want to have a carbon neutral economy, a lot of those are going to require innovation in material science or chemistry or biology or, or other fields like that. In material science, the typical time to go from discovery to high volume manufacturing is 17 to 20 years um, because there's a lot of that, uh, which is trial and error. Um, and so we need to compress the time and cost associated with that end-to-end with that -end process of going from discovery to high volume manufacturing. And um, I think that this is an area where the combination of informatics, um, um, robotics, simulation, and machine learning uh, could make a difference in terms of compressing the design, build, test, learn cycle associated with science and engineering. Any more questions, Emma Mark? No? Nope, makes sense, right. thanks. Yep. Okay, I'm gonna switch tracks completely. So a lot of folks in the community, as with a lot of the tech industry, are really interested in Web3, DeFi, DAOs, um, et cetera. Um, and you know, a lot of people believe that it will level the play field whether it's in like banking, labor, um, markets, uh, even governance for that matter. Um, I was just speaking to someone yesterday who was working with the Oakland government uh, to build a DAO that focused on governance and issuing tokens um, in, the, in the community of Oakland itself. But this is Tamina's point of view. I haven't totally bought into it, but she believes technology itself never solves social problems. Um, so you need technology and something else. Mm -hmm. um, so according to you, what do you think is the intrinsic value of Web3 technology and who would be responsible for ensuring that they achieve shared prosperity, which is not happening right now? Yeah, so uh, I would say in general, you know, Web3 and crypto is the first technology that has made me feel old. Uh, because when I read the skeptics, uh, I find them uh, sometimes to be more convincing than, than the advocates. So that's not to say that, you know, something useful, uh, you know, won't come out of it at, at some point. There's clearly a lot of, um, you know, people who um, are very smart, people like Vitalik Buterin, who I've spent some time with. Um, I just have a sense of, if you've got lots of people who are that smart who are working on something, uh, I would never say nothing will cut, nothing is going to come out of it. Um, the um, so one way in which some uh, you know someone in their twenties um, tried to explain it to me when I was saying this bored ape yacht club, I don't get it. Why are people spending you know three million dollars for a you know a JPEG of a an ape? Um, and, um, he said, well, you just have to like, accept the fact that there's a, a market in the billions and billions of dollars for virtual goods. So, you know, people who have lots of money and are like really obsessed with some game might think, uh, think nothing of dropping hundreds of thousands of dollars for, you know, a sword in this in some game that they play it in the same way that um you know maybe previously rich people had spent money on sports cars and uh and and art um so i i kind of get that at, at some level um and so i guess the way my mind works is could you harness that the fact that like right now someone is willing to spend a lot of money on a, on a DFT um, and, you know, put it on their Twitter handler uh, for, uh, for something that, at, le at least in my view, would also have some um, societal reference. So, could, for example, could you use uh, DFTs to fund science and as opposed to, uh, so for example, um, one problem that we have is antimicrobial resistance. Um, so if we don't do anything about this problem and we live in a 
uh, a world in which penicillin and all, and all the other antibiotics just stop working, then 10 million people a year uh, will die. So that would be a bad thing. And scientists are like telling us now. So I think it would be like, it's, it's the equivalent of a very, very slow car crash. So it would be pretty pathetic if we weren't able to get our act together to do something about this before you know, lots more people die. Um, so is there a way in which, you know, as opposed to people having a, you know, a bored ape uh, JPEG, that they were like, hey, I funded this, uh, you know, here's the molecule that my, uh, that my philanthropy funded uh, or something like that. So anyway, that's, I, I, I get that people are willing to spend a lot of money on this. Um, and I'm just wondering whether there's that sort of um, people's willingness to do this could be harnessed in a way that would be more societally productive than uh, than rare pictures of a apes with that have laser beams coming out of their eyes and gold fur. But you know, I'm just a boomer, so what do I know? And you're on mute again, Richie. Yeah, I was. I'm sorry, that was my baby in the background. But I was just going to call you a boomer myself. Yeah. <laughs> but in in that spirit, let's just move on to something else. <laughs> um, I, I I've been told that you've also worked on vaccine development in the past. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious how you feel about the vaccine rollout. You know, there is a new belief coming about that the vaccine actually might have slowed down recovery from the pandemic in general. Um, and now with the Omicron virus, like, you know, and, and, and the breakout Delta cases, like, you know, it doesn't, it's not clear um, whether the vaccine was like as, I mean, there's just a lot of different points of views um, in, in, in um, you know, well, uh, I, I, I would just say like well-informed societies and people. So I, I'm just wondering like, where are you at um, with your thoughts on the latest uh, mutation and the rollout itself, um, the global rollout? Yeah, so um, we've supported some economists who have looked at like the net societal benefits of vaccinating the world. Uh, and it's really, really high. I mean, the cost to the, you know, setting aside the the, the tragedy and the and the uh, lives lost, the economic cost to the global economy are in the tens of trillions of dollars. So it really makes all the sense in the world um, for um, you know wealthy countries to get together and just uh, have a strategy. Um, for um, for vaccinating the world, because if we don't do that, then you're just going to have new variants, um, and we're not going to get into a position where we can really genuinely put this uh, behind us, and you know, not have it to continue to result in this really significant loss of human life. Um, so that's one thing. The I mean the um, I think the you know, Sorry, if, if is, you have that data, that if that if the tr if there is truly that much benefit, then is there a path to getting the entire world vaccinated? Well, um, I think the the issue is that it's a global public good, right? So it's it's not like there's any one entity in the system um, that has an incentive to solve the problem by themselves, um, and I think that. Um, it's difficult for decision makers um, to prioritize the needs of, of other people relative to their own country. So I, I think that that's some of the reasons why it's difficult. Uh, but I think it's definitely the case that it would be, it would pay for itself many times over for the wealthy countries, you know, the G7, the G20, some group like that to get together and say, okay, how much is it gonna cost and you know we're going to pay for it, and then you know with medium income countries, obviously there should be some burden sharing. It's not like it needs to be free to all countries, but you know for for countries that 
um, where people are living on two dollars a day, I, I think there's limits as, as to what we can expect them to afford. Interesting. Um, I mean, does anyone have any questions on Omicron or the COVID vaccine before I move on? No? Guys, this is the new hotness, but I think everyone is totally COVID out in some sense. I have another question. You know, I think you bring up an interesting point of view and I've, I've often thought about it as it relates to climate and um, climate change uh, topics and it just, one piece of it is technology. The other piece of it is policy. Just as you mentioned with vaccines, like, you know, it is a global problem. So no one person can take it on. Um, so every time, like, you know, the G7 or the G21 or whatever the case is, come together to talk about climate policy. Um, personally, I, you know, I was brought up and raised in India, and I just find it so hard that, you know, you can make these demands of developing nations when, like, you know, developed nations already have so much of the infrastructure, etc., in place. So I, I'm just like, in, you know, in, in, in when we face problems like this, whether it's the global pandemic or whether it's like climate change, and it, there is no one person or one entity that can drive it forward. Um, what, what have you seen work or like, how do you see this moving forward in the future? Um, yeah. The only way I can think of it is like, if every American was willing to like part with dollars to help bring up um, um, income levels in, develop, in developing nations, then it would make sense to ask them not to do certain things. Um, but that's never going to happen. So I'm just like, how do you like solve problems at a global scale then? Yeah. So I think one thing to do um, is to make uh, eliminate the green premium uh, between the you know the carbon neutral solution and whatever the current solution is. So you know the the reason that that solar and wind um, are now beginning to to get so much traction in the marketplace is that in many instances uh, they are uh, you know cheaper uh, or as affordable as the fossil fuel version and they're on something that looks a little bit more like a technology cost curve in terms of the reduction uh, than you know the, uh, the the fossil fuel industry. So I think one of the things that the United States can can do, is to say, how do we move these technologies down the cost curve um, as rapidly as possible? You're also seeing companies do this as well. So Stripe has, has started to do this for carbon dioxide removal. Um, a group of companies has created something called the Clean Energy Buyers Alliance. Uh, so how do you get something down the experience curve, the cost curve, so that the right thing to do is also the profitable thing to do. And then that'll make it a lot uh, easier for, uh, for developing countries like India to say, okay, you know, the developed countries have like gotten solar, wind, uh, you know, electric vehicles, batteries, carbon neutral versions of cement, plant-based alternatives to meat, and they've driven them down the experience curves uh, to the point where the, the you know, green premium is, is either non-existent or is, is manageable. Gotcha. Um, I have a lot more questions, um, but you know, we've been um, talking for about 40 minutes here. So I wanted to open it up to the audience um, two ways of asking Tom questions. Feel free to unmute yourself and ask the question and or paste it in chat and we'll take it from there. Anyone? I'm wondering if uh, you've done any work or uh, funded any uh, people or organizations related to artistic expression. Um, I have the, I have not personally, when I worked for president Obama, um, 
I got very interested in the maker movement. Um, and we had a uh, maker fair at the White House. Um, so um, that is a form of, you know, sort of democratizing the tools that are needed to design and make just about anything with 3D printers and laser cutters and, and things like that. Um, it, it definitely uh, a form of uh, artistic expression. Thank you, and thanks for joining us today. Sure. Alex, can you unmute and ask your question? Sure. Uh, my question is, uh, what do you think is the greatest unmet need in either society or science? Uh, and if you've already talked about it, that's totally fine. Yeah, I mean, certainly one that I think is really pressing is climate change because of the sort of li limited window of opportunity that we have to, to solve it. So it's, it's clearly not the only one. Um, you know, long term, I am interested in the idea of expanding um, human civilization out into the solar system and, and beyond. Um, so the um, this sort of edgiest uh, blog post that I did um, when I was working for President Obama was talking about this idea of, of bootstrapping a solar system civilization. And the idea was that right now um, doing things in, in space is very expensive because all of the matter and energy that we use in space comes from Earth. Um, but you'd like to be in a position where that's not true and more and more of the energy and, and mass that you're using uh, for activities in space uh, come from space. Um, and so you, you would start with relatively simple things like fuel and water, um, but then over time uh, you could imagine um, being able to uh, do more complicated things as, as well, like take lunar regolith and turn it into solar cells, for example. And then over the very long term, you could imagine creating um, self-replicating robotic factories, that is, you know, robotic factories that can make copies of themselves. Um, so I'll put a link in the chat to that. Um, so I think, but in general, I'm very interested in the question of how do we, um, as a society, become more intentional about setting and meeting ambitious goals. Um, so, um, for example, um, the br breaking down a big problem like climate change into a couple dozen problems and, and having a clear sense for what would constitute a win in that area. Um, doing the same thing in, in health, uh, in economic and social mobility. So I'll give you one example of uh, a challenge that, that I've talked to some people in the tech industry, which is to say, hey, in Silicon Valley, uh, the status symbol is a unicorn, that is a startup which has a market cap of a billion dollars. Uh, what would it um, take to create a, uh, a unicorn for the middle class? So what, what do I mean by that? So what enterprise could increase the incomes of 100,000 non-college educated workers by $10,000? That, that would be uh, a unicorn for the middle class. Um, so new forms of hiring that rely less on whether or not you have a, a four-year degree, uh, the use of advances in learning science and learning technology to uh, give someone a skill that is a ticket to the middle class and be able to do that in months rather than years, and mechanisms for funding workforce development that look more like equity as opposed to debt. So one could imagine the uh, some combination of those innovations in those areas of, of hiring, of rapid training, and in financing workforce development that could lead to ladders of economic and social mobility for non-college educated workers who've seen their real wages decline by 12% uh, over the last uh, several decades. 
Hey, Tom. Yes. Um, yes. Ishwar here. Actually, from your very unique perspective, I'd be very interested to know what is the greatest unmet need in healthcare and perhaps structuring it from the perspective of if you could have a magic wand to build some technology that was that would solve a lot of problems for a lot of people, what would that look like? Yeah, so, um, so someone who I've worked with for a, a long time is uh, Arthi Prabhakar, um, and she was uh, President Obama's uh, director of, of DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. She's created a new nonprofit organization called Actuate, um, in which she's asking the question, what would, it, what would be required to take the DARPA mechanism for uh, solving problems um, and apply it to uh, a broad range of economic and societal challenges? Um, and one that she's identified is, you know, we spend a huge amount of money uh, on, um, on chronic diseases, uh, diabetes being a good example. And a lot of those are, um, are things that, that can be prevented uh, through behavior change, uh, through things like diet and exercise. And it just turns out that getting people to ch change their diet and exercise is really, really hard. Um, we know that if you had enough money uh, and you could give everyone their own personal coach, um, that can make a difference, but that is not necessarily a, a scalable solution. So is there some you know, technology um, and uh, application of behavioral science that could approximate the effectiveness of giving everyone their one-on-one -on -one coach and thereby avoiding uh, some of these chronic diseases. Um, so anyway, I, I think that's, I, I think scalable approaches to prevention, given how much premature morbidity and mortality is due to things like diet and, and exercise and uh, drug and alcohol abuse. Thanks. I have a question, um, if we can squeeze in a couple more questions. Sure. Um, I actually moved to the US from Albania, which is considered a developing country. And we're seeing a lot of obviously corruption and brain drain and little innovation. Uh, this is a big question, but like, is there anything a country with amazing natural resources can do to stop this vicious cycle of unstable political landscape, talent leaving and repeat uh, feedback loop? Um, it is not easy. Um, and the reason is, is that, so there's a phenomena that um, social scientists call path dependence, um, which says that, you know, a lot of, of reasons for some of these uh, challenges um, are, have a, historical backgrounds. So a, a good example is if you said, you know, why do, do many Latin American countries um, have such high levels of inequality? Um, and, uh, you know, a, a reason is, is that um, unlike say North America and Australia and New, New Zealand where Europeans um, actually settled um, in, in those countries. And so you started off with um, you know, a more equal society. Um, in Latin America, um, because of things like malaria, um, there were um, there were sort of um, the the colonization strategy was very different, and a lot of it was about ex you know creating these giant plantations and exploiting the indigenous uh, populations for forced labor. And you know, once you have a system where uh, you have these extractive institutions that are run by the elites for the elites, it's a, it's a lot more difficult to make the transition to more inclusive pro-growth and, and pro-innovation uh, because those people who have the power are not particularly excited about giving it up. Um, 
the w one idea that people have uh, talked about is this idea of charter cities. Um, and you can see a, you know, an example of this um, when Deng Xiaoping decided, hey, we want to start experimenting with these special economic zones. Um, and that led to you know, huge levels of economic growth and job creation in, in Shenzhen and uh, you know, 10% per year economic growth in, in, in China. So this, so if you could get some countries who said, okay, we're actually going to be willing to do some experimentation, we're going to we're going to come up with a new set of rules that will enable private sector investment. I think uh, that is is worth trying. Thank you. I can All jump. right. Sorry, go ahead. We have time for maybe two more questions. Okay. Um, yeah, I saw that you funded um, some ethics, ethics and technology programs and prizes. Is that right? Yeah. So we, uh, so for example, we supported uh, something uh, jointly with the OMIDIAR network right. uh, and Craig Newmark, right. uh, which was about trying to embed ethics into the undergraduate CS curriculum. Yeah. Um, so one particularly clever idea was, you know, don't just have like an upper division uh, ethics course that's an elective. Um, identify the core courses that all the undergraduates have to take, like data structures and algorithms, and pick homework problems and problem sets that raise ethical issues. Uh, so, for example, uh, you make the students design a resume sorting algorithm and recognizing that there are big, uh, you know, societal consequences uh, that that flow from the design decisions that you make. So I thought that was a really clever idea. Yeah, I'm, and I'm, I'm curious if that also extends into addressing obstacles within existing organizations, because we've been talking about cl climate change and pandemics, and there's a lot of challenges there in global coordination, understanding, misinformation, is there, like, do you have the capacity, even just given the principle to, to move on those issues also? Um, like innovation and product design and recommendation engines that depolarize, like things in sort of that space. Yeah, so um, we're supporting a, a pr professor who's interested in, in whether there's a social science informed intervention um, that could reduce political polarization. Uh, so that is something, that's an example of something that, that we're supporting. Uh, but I think that's an area that, you know, deserves a lot more attention. Very um, cool. So uh, yeah, we're, we're definitely open to ideas in that area. Let, let me close with uh, a thought experiment that I used to pose to people when I worked for President Obama and see if you either have any ideas or um, run into people who you think might have an idea to answer this question, which is, so this is the thought experiment that I used to pose to people is, you have a meeting in the Oval Office with the president um, and he says, uh, Ruchi, um, if you give me a good idea for improving the human condition, then I will call anyone on the planet. Um, it can be a conference call, so there can be more than one person on the line. If it's someone who works for the federal government, I can direct them to do something because I'm their boss. If it's someone uh, outside the government, I can challenge them to do something. So you have to tell me not only what your idea is, but in order to make your idea happen, um, who would I call uh, and what would I ask them to do? Um, so um, the the premise for the, uh, the thought experiment is several fold. One is it's a version of the Hamming question. Um, so uh, Hamming was a researcher at Bell Labs and he used to ask his colleagues, what is the most important question in your field and why aren't you working on it? So presumably if you really had a meeting with the president, you would 
pitch them on something that you thought was really like a really important issue as opposed to a second or third tier issue. The other is that most um, problems require building coalitions. Um, and it's very difficult to build a coalition if you can't articulate, number one, who are the members of the coalition? And number two, what are the mutually reinforcing steps um, that would need to be, that they would need to take in order to achieve the goal? So um, if you, uh, Ruchi, would you be willing to collect ideas from people to the extent that they have any in, in answer to this question? Yeah, I would love to, and we'd be happy to forward them. I'm right. going to co-vote Tamina to help me with this. <laughs> Absolutely, would love to do that. Yeah. And I, I, I did a, a 10 minute video on this thought experiment, um, but the TLDR version is, if you, is just, if you could call anyone, who would you call and what would you ask them to do? That's a pretty good one. Hopefully we can get a few. So here's the question. Assuming we send you this back, will you place the call for the one you like the best? Absolutely. Okay, I'm gonna hold you to that. So now instead of one, I'm gonna request that you place the call for the top three. <laughs> All right. I'll I'll uh, I'll place the calls for the ones that have the highest social expected return. Sounds great. Um, could we get the link to that video, please? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, and Gorda, I'm I'm imagining you have the list of people who actually attended this talk. Okay, this is going to be exciting. <laughs> I love ending talks with something concrete. I appreciate it, Tom. And uh, I'll, I'll send it to you in the email, but there's, there's a link in the chat. Okay, sounds great. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Um, no, thank you for the great questions. Yeah, and like I said, love ending the talk with something concrete. So hopefully something good will come out of this. Sounds good. All Thanks right. so much, Tom. Yep. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.